Actually got all three outs in the 10th inning. His 2-1 pitch. Diggs drives it deep to right center field. You gotta go. That ball is gone. Kendall Diggs will send him back to the hotel. With a walk-off homer, the Hogs win 6-5 on Diggs' 11th of the year. Doesn't get any better than that, am I right? So let's talk about it on today's Locked On Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 103.7 The Buzz. Dot com. Hope everybody's having a wonderful Thursday as uh, hopefully the uh, video is a little bit fixed today. Been having some issues with the internet, but still it's a good one to fix everything and to be able to talk about it there as you heard in the intro and the excitement surrounding it as Arkansas takes care of business and gets the victory over Texas A&M in the very first SEC tournament game in walk-off style. What a game and what a performance there by Arkansas and especially by uh, the guy who is always so clutch seems like more often than not, and that is the guy Kendall Diggs. I mean, it was just incredible uh, being there. Again, I, I was there and live and in person. And uh, there's a lot of things that we'll dive into for this game and give our reactions to, as well as talk some about some basketball and some other things too. But uh, you know, if you listen to the podcast yesterday or even the day before, we talked about uh, the SEC tournament and, and what we want to see. And I was saying how I'd like to go zero and two and I think when there were some people that maybe kind of took that out of context at times too, because it's not, I wasn't saying I want to go 0 2 for the selfish reasons. I was saying I wanted to go 0 2 to prevent any sort of injuries from happening. That That's the mentality. So if they go 1 and 2, that's fine. Like I'm not going to say that that was a bad thing or anything like that. It's just about staying healthy at this point in time and not exhausting your pitching. And this game actually went to extra innings against Texas AM which was a little bit concerning because you don't want to uh, put forth uh, guys that end up uh, having too much issue or too many troubles uh, for them. But Arkansas only used three pitchers today, and there were guys that uh, needed to get the experience there too. And uh, just uh, two guys really uh, were the difference makers in this game as you had uh, not only in the scoring side of things, you had uh, Jared Wagner, welcome back, with a grand slam, grand salami piss missile that just uh, shot it over the moon as uh, he was able to get Arkansas on the board to take the lead over Texas A&M, 5-4. to four. A&M came back and scored a couple more, uh, or at least one more, to be able to send it to extra innings there in the top of the ninth inning. And as they hit a solo shot over on Will McIntyre, but then Arkansas went back and forth. And then the bottom of the 11th inning is when Kendall Diggs ended up knocking it out of the park and walking it off for Arkansas. So just a, a really weird game at times. Uh, I thought that, First off, uh, you know, AM did a good job against Arkansas, and you know, Arkansas is now 4 0 against the Aggies, which was great. And uh, you had some guys really stand out. Of course, Wagner being the guy uh, with, with the big hit, but even uh, Peyton Holt, he got two hits in this game. Uh, had Parker Rowland have a hit in this game, too. Uh, Kendall Diggs finished with two hits. Uh, that was essentially it, though. And Slavens and Cowley both had a hit, a piece there, too. So uh, we'll talk about the pitching in a second, but just talking about the, the lineup in the hitting and, and everything at the start. Uh, I I thought that the offense started off really slow and they started having their issues and they weren't they weren't getting to the point to where they were or leaving too many people on base is what really what it came down to. They got guys in scoring position and just couldn't figure out how to how to bring them home. 
and that's usually not a not a not a bad uh, or not a good look, especially uh, Arkansas in this game left eleven players on base, and Texas A and M only had five players left on base. So Arkansas had their opportunities. They had uh, bases loaded at times too, and just couldn't close it out. Couldn't get the scoring going, uh, which was frustrating. Um, you know, Tavion Josenberger, he went over five in this game. Uh, you also had uh, you know a guy like uh, you know Harold Cole, Harold Cole. He he went over over two in this one. Uh, they did have to do some pinch hitting. And, and so they just, they, they were trying to figure some things out and just trying to, you know, advance the guys to getting in. And honestly, the play that I'm sure that a lot of people started bringing up and mentioning, and maybe some frustrations that came from it was the one where, uh, Arkansas had runners at second and third with one out in the bottom of the 10th inning. I mean, it was the bottom of the 10th or the ninth. Uh, but they had two runners in scoring position. Uh, it seemed like they had it all in control. It seemed like everything was going to go well for them. And they decided with Parker Rowland to bat, uh, to like, do a squeeze bunt, which failed miserably because he he gets contact on it, but pitcher picks it up and throws it right back to home plate and then ends up getting the tag out. And then there's two outs with runners at the corners. So it just uh, didn't work the way that uh, they were wanting to. And Dave Van Horn even explained it uh, a little bit more in detail where he was saying that because of, the fact that they couldn't really pinch hit Parker Rowland due to the fact that their backup catcher uh, was throwing up uh, pretty much all night and was extremely sick and uh, and couldn't and couldn't be the guy uh, to to step it, to step into that role and they don't really have a third string catcher or at least they do and it's Peyton Holt but Peyton Holt's at second base right now so it's just basically where the injuries continue to mount so they couldn't do a pinch hit uh, they felt good about it and even felt good about uh, the bunt and what they were trying to do but. Uh, as David Horn alluded to, it, it was he made contact on it, but it wasn't the bunt that they were looking for. It wasn't the place that they wanted to place it. Like it, it, it's just it's one of those deals to where there's a lot of people that are critical of it. But if Dave Van Horn and Arkansas pull it off and they win and walk it off, nobody's saying it's a bad decision. But because it ended up leading to an out, everybody said it was a bad decision. So you know it, it's it's one of those deals to where I'm 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 fine with it. Like I'm not looking at it in, in a negative way and and saying that oh this was a pro this was a problem. But it was definitely one of those head scratching things where you're like, man, I don't, I don't know if I like that. I don't want to see that ever happen again. Uh, but they got the job done, and they had clutch hitting, and they and they got it done when it matters the most. And then the pitching, you had Cody Adcock who got the start. Uh, then Zach Morris comes in in relief, and then Will McIntyre finished it out. Now Cody Adcock only got two innings in. Uh, I thought that he started off strong in the first two innings too, but when it came to the third inning. Uh, you could tell that things were starting to fall apart a little bit on him. Uh, he gave up two hits, three earned runs, uh, only one strikeout while facing uh, facing eight batters, or excuse me, facing 10 batters, and uh, threw 48 pitches. So he started off strong, but then just in that third inning, things got a little bit quirky and out of hand, and they and Arkansas was giving up three runs in that particular inning in the third. So then Zach Morris comes in, and Zach Morris does a phenomenal job. Uh, he gives up only three hits on one earned run, had five strikeouts on 85 pitches and faced 19 batters. So I thought that he looked at the very beginning, it was a little bit shaky, but he really locked it in and, and had a great showing and pitched for five innings. And then Will McIntyre, uh, old Big Mac, uh, he was the guy that ended up closing it out and, and pitching for four innings, which is probably more than what Dave Van Horn was wanting to, but still uh, took care of business and also pitched really great. He only gave up two hits, one run. Uh, and uh, also had three strikeouts with 60 pitches thrown. So, you know, you can't ask for anything more when it comes to the win. Uh, everybody got out of there healthy, at least, and uh, that was a little bit of a scary moment, of course, with uh, uh, the situation there at home plate where they were trying to throw him out, and maybe there was going to be like, you know, the, if it was going to hurt his shoulder or something like that. I don't know. There could have been a lot of different things that could have gone wrong there, but they got it done. They took care of business. They got the win, and now they're going to be facing off against LSU today or at least this afternoon at around 4 30 it'll probably be after 4 30 just because that's the way it's gone pretty much the entire time of, uh, of some of these games getting pushed back and back especially if there's any extra inning games too but uh arkansas and dave van horn they get the job done in game one and they're going to be facing off against lsu tomorrow i bet you uh skins or skeens i always forget how to say his name but he's in, he's a phenomenal pitcher he'll he'll probably get the start tomorrow or today yeah today and also, uh, Hagen Smith looks like he's going to get the start. So we'll see if Arkansas can take care of business against LSU. But it was definitely a good first game to go around, that's for sure. And I'll tell you this, when I was out there, uh, it, it was perfect weather. Perfect weather out there. 
uh, for this SEC tournament. And it's usually it's extremely hot here in Hoover. But the one thing that made it so perfect, too, was the fact that I was wearing my bird dogs. My bird dogs, they're everything. I mean, they were perfectly fitting for every occasion. And even when it's warm outside, they stay comfortable. They stay looking good. And they're able to make it to where even if you're outside, even if you're sweating a little bit, even if you're active, you still find a way to look, make them look good, feel good, and you don't get all built up with everything like sweat and all that. It's 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 amazing. Like there, I know it says every single time that we have come on this podcast about the fact that this Bird Dogs product is capable of any and every different occasion, but it's true. And even watching baseball games, it's the same thing. I'm going to go play golf uh, today, and uh, that's probably why I'm recording this podcast a little bit early. I'm going to wear my Bird Dogs because it's comfortable, it's versatile, uh, they they fit great. You got to try them out. So head over to birddogs.com slash locked on college. That's birddogs.com slash locked on college and enter in that promo code locked on college and they'll throw in a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler, uh, tumbler with every single order. You won't want to miss it. Check out all their great products, all the different things they have by going over to birddogs.com slash locked on college. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so continuing on with our next segment of the Locked On Razorbacks podcast, I do want to give a little bit of an update on the uh, the, the basketball side of things as there was some sad news today. I, I believe it's sad news um, with a coaching change. Not anything that's because we've always talked about the transfer portal and uh, what that's been like and what it's looked like and everything. But uh, this particularly has to do with the coaching staff as Gus Arginal, who's been the assistant coach for the Razorback basketball team over the past few seasons under Muss, uh, has officially left for a head coaching job out in California. In fact, uh, he's been, been with Arkansas for the past two seasons, and now he's the new head coach at Cal State San Bernardino. And that's a D2 school. And you probably see that or you think about that, and you're like, why in the world would Gus Arginal go from being the assistant coach at a major university in a big-time program like Arkansas to go be the head coach of a place like in a D2 school. Well, in the case of uh, Gus Arginal, uh, he was a head coach back at Cal State East Bay for four seasons from 2013 to 2017. And he did a few things in between there, but Cal State Bernardino is the same team that's in that same conference, the California Collegiate Athletic Association. So it's one that Gus Arginal is extremely familiar with as well. Uh, he was an assistant coach, of course, under Musselman, uh, even at Nevada. And, uh, and so he's decided to take this new opportunity. And Musselman, of course, is excited for him. He's a new coach there, and he's a great leader. Uh, also in the press release, uh, Gus Arginal called it an incredible opportunity to, to go over there. And uh, apparently the Coyotes is what they're called. They went 31-4 and four and played in the Final Four of the NCAA Division II tournament earlier this year. So he's excited to be about it. He says, quote, I cannot be more excited to be a part of the campus community that gives its student athletes an elite collegiate experience. Coyote basketball has a story tradition of winning and also on the national stage. My goal is to build an incredible culture of winning in and out of the classroom through hard work, brotherhood and passion. My team will be aggressive and attack from both sides of the ball, utilizing a positionless bat a style that takes advantage of mismatches and plays great pace for 40 minutes. So uh, that makes sense if that's kind of the way that uh, you know Arkansas, of course, has done it. And now he is uh, going to be moving on. So this will be the fourth. Uh, with his departure, it will be the fourth offseason in as many years when Usman's had to fill an assistant coaching position. So each and every year, an assistant coach leaves. Uh, as uh, Corey Williams has left, David Patrick's left, and uh, Clay Mosier has left uh, as well. So uh, Arkansas and Gus Malzahn, uh, Gus Malzahn, Eric Musselman, man, that's bad. Sorry, I was talking about Auburn and Gus Malzahn earlier. Uh, Eric Mussman's going to have to now hire in his new assistant coach. And I'll say this, um, I, I feel good anytime that Eric Musselman has to do anything like the, the guy knows what he's doing. I don't know if he's going to hire within the staff or does he go a different direction and maybe go the route of, of, you know, somebody out there that's already in the mix. Uh, you know, I don't really know exactly the direction he's going to go, but I'm going to trust him with no matter what he does. I mean, he's a guy that has been around a long time and knows his coaches and knows his teams and, knows uh, the best way to, to get them in positions to be really good and take advantage of things as well. So uh, I trust him here. But as far as Arginal leaving, uh, I selfishly, I wanted him to stay. I think Gus Arginal is a, a phenomenal coach and a phenomenal human being. And every single interaction I've ever had with him, 
He's been awesome. He's come on this podcast before. Uh, earlier that se- uh, this past season when uh, Trevor to Brazil, after that posterizing dunk, we've had some fun with that and talked about it. And uh, he was always extremely nice, and he was a great recruiter. And he was somebody that, like, there was a reason why Musselman had him back on his staff. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I had to go to Nevada and I moved on to bigger, better things. It's like, no, he wanted him back on his staff because he knew the value that he brought forth. So selfishly, I wanted Gus Arginal to stay here. Uh, I think that this is a loss for Arkansas, not to say that they won't be okay, but it is a loss for the Razorbacks. And I also believe that, um, you know, he will go on to to be great and, and taking that next step forward and being great for, uh, you know, whichever programs he ends up going with in the future. But in this particular case, being back out there in California, which I know he's from and he loves that area. So it always makes sense that he's going to be there. So uh, wish him nothing but the best of luck and nothing but love for Gus Arginal. Uh, he, he was took part of the couple of years of Arkansas basketball that were extremely memorable, uh, both years knocking off a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, and again, he'll do a great job no matter where he goes. But this particular case, going back to California, uh, it all makes sense. And I think all, all Razorback fans are definitely going to uh, give him the love that he deserves and the, and the appreciation that he has. So we wish you the best of luck, Coach Arginal. And uh, we'll keep you updated on what Arkansas decides to do when it comes to their coaching staff under Eric Musselman. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some kind of news or at least some uh, speculation at this point in time dealing with the SEC baseball tournament on the other side of the break. So stay with us here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. We've talked about the SEC baseball tournament because here I am here in uh, Hoover and uh, talking about it and covering it and having fun so far. And uh, we'll see how long it, it continues to last uh, for, for Arkansas and, and what they're trying to do. But, um, you know, I was uh, sitting there and I, I've, I've talked to some people and I, I think I maybe even alluded to it a little bit about the reports coming out about the possibility of the SEC tournament ending up uh, leaving the Hoover Met and, and going to a, a different spot. And it seems like there's some traction behind that. As uh, when Texas and Oklahoma end up joining the SEC, you know that they're going to do some things to try to cater, not in every regard, but try to make them feel a little bit welcome by having some events, maybe more so on that side of the country. Uh, And I think that the SEC tournament in baseball would be one of those events. And people have discussed about where it could end up going. But the one that's definitely getting thrown around is the fact that they're looking to possibly move the SEC tournament to Arlington Arlington at the uh, Globe Life Field. Now, that's not anything that's being reported officially. That's not anything that uh, has been confirmed. But it seems to have some sort of traction or at least some sort of smoke as to that might be the next move for them. And I talked to some people who have really mixed feelings on this. And even there in the media, I was talking to a few people, and it seemed like the ones that weren't on board with it seem to be the ones that would have to travel further to get there. Uh, People in Alabama, people in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, people in Florida, you know, all of that, which, you know, I get that. I kind of probably be the same way if it was an easy trip for me and knowing that the SEC offices are right here in in Birmingham, so they're close by. But if they moved it to Arlington, uh, I think that it would be nothing but a benefit because – We'll we'll look at it for the uh, selfish reasons and then the real reasons. The selfish reasons is is because Arkansas would travel incredible, and we know that there are a ton of Razorback fans there in the Dallas Metro. So Razorback fans would be able to take over uh, the SEC tournament or at least be able to compete with the amount of people there at the SEC tournament alongside with the likes of LSU or Mississippi State or Texas, even to that regard, because there's so many fans there. It's an easy drive from Little Rock for about four hours. Uh, four and a half hours and uh, it's a fairly easy drive from Fayetteville and also uh, you know I think Razorback fans would just really enjoy it and appreciate that and then on that's more of the selfish reasons but also let's look at the actual reasons that would impact everybody number one you're playing in a major league ballpark like that's in a dome and maybe some people like being on the outside elements and that's fine too But to be able to add into the possibility of being a team or having teams that play in a major league baseball park that you never have to worry about rain delays ever. And it's a controlled environment and it's got all the makings for what it would want. You would want baseball to be like 
that's a huge draw, a huge draw for uh, many different reasons because of that fact. Uh, so I think that's a big one. I also think that travel with everybody is 100% easier. Now, is it as close for people in Birmingham or people in Florida or wherever to go to and drive to? No, but here's the thing. You know what Dallas has? A massive freaking airport to where you can literally go to any airport in the country and you can find a way to fly into Dallas. Whether it's DFW or Love Field or whatever, you can find a way. So it's so much better when it comes to flights and travel for everybody to get to a little bit easier, especially with the direct flights. And also, it, it just draws, a, I think, a, a, like a new fresh thing. Uh, I was at the Hoover Met today, and it's fine. Like it, It's really fine. But there's just things about it to where I'm like, man, it'd be so much more fun to have it in a major league ballpark and in a place where I know the Big 12 title or the Big 12 uh, – uh, game, uh, big, big 12 tournament games are there. And so we know that that's a, that's a big deal for them, but I, you know, I've heard that maybe they're going to move to Houston. Maybe they'll go down there to uh, uh minute Maid. So, you know, again, nothing confirmed, nothing like that, but I still think it'd be a great thing. And I hope that actually happens. And that would be like some of the benefits to where maybe because of Oklahoma and Texas joining in, some of the events will be more on our side of the sec rather than always having to travel far away. Who knows? Maybe media days will go to Dallas uh, maybe they'll have uh, the SEC basketball tournament in Dallas. Uh, I'm all for getting the Dallas market and bringing things to Dallas because it's so much easier for Razorback fans to be so much better. And I think we'd all agree there too. Appreciate everybody listening in to Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter, Buzz John Neighbors, for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. Keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then.